Okay, hello everybody. I'm Richard Southwell, and I'd like to talk to you about best response games. So, I did a project on best response games a few years ago now in the University of Sheffield, and this was joint work with Chris Cannings. So, this is basically a project about game theory. Um, more particularly, it's a project about what happens when uh, individuals play games on graphs or networks. So, uh, let me just explain what, what these things are. Um, a graph, or um, alternatively a network, is basically where you have a set of dots called vertices connected by some lines called edges. So, there's lots of uh, important examples of real-world networks, um, such as the internet, social networks, um, various kind of biological networks, um, you know, things like ecosystems, protein-protein interaction networks, um, nervous systems, uh, lots and lots of... So there's lots of networks in the world, okay? And the second thing is, what is a game? Because this is really a project on game theory. So a game, basically, is where you have a load of individuals, and they choose strategies, and then they get some kind of payoff. And the payoffs that they get depend on the strategies which they choose, but also on the strategies which other players choose. And so you have this uh, phenomena where um, the group's decisions affect the individual. Okay, so as I've already said, this is a project about games on graphs. So basically, um, there's a few important things that people really want to understand about games on graphs. Uh, they want to understand how the structure of the network interconnecting the players affects the strategic decisions that they make. You see, this is a very important issue, especially these days. Uh, in systems like ecology, it's important to understand how the spatial distribution of the animals affects their behavior or their evolution. Um, and in economics um, and um, media studies, it's getting more and more important to understand how the sort of way something like an economic network or, or the web is interconnected and how that interconnectivity affects the kind of strategic decisions that individuals within the network make. Um, so there are lots of kinds of questions that you can ask uh, in this kind of topic, like what sorts of structures promote cooperation? If the uh, network interconnecting the players has a certain topology, uh, maybe that's more likely to make the players within cooperate with each other and choose strategies which benefit the whole. Another good question is, what kinds of games induce particular dynamics? Um, for example, you might be an engineer, and you might be wanting to control some kind of network, like, say, a wireless network or something. And um, you might be interested in what kinds of scenarios uh, will promote the players to act in a way that you want them to. See, this is a very kind of um, clever way of doing decentralized control because um, you know if you can make the rewards and punishments in a system um, such that the players will follow the dynamics you wish to induce of their own free will then you save a lot um, of energy in um, trying to control the system okay so in this project, we really looked at the dynamics of some very, very simple rules. Um, and the idea is just that we have a network structure, and we have these vertices within. And we think of the vertices as players. And basically, these vertices engage in games with their neighbours on the network. And the basic idea behind these systems is that Every time step, every vertex, simultaneously updates to play the best response to their current surroundings. What do I mean by that? I mean that um, these players are interested in choosing the best thing they possibly can and scoring the best possible payoff against their surroundings.
I'll explain in more detail how this kind of thing actually works. Basically, we have a game and we have a network. These are the basic ingredients behind one of these best response systems. So the way that we represent our game is by a so-called payoff matrix. So here's an example. And what this matrix is, is it's basically a, a square full of numbers uh, showing what payoffs uh, different strategies get against other strategies. For example, if you use the red strategy against somebody who uses the blue strategy, you score a payoff of four. If you sc uh, use the red strategy against someone else who uses the red strategy, you score a payoff of minus two. So this is a standard kind of gizmo in game theory. And in fact, this game, which is represented here by this payoff matrix, is the Dove Hawk game. So um, the blue strategy here, this represents this kind of passive, cooperative, hawk-like strategy. Whereas this red thing here, this represents the, sorry, this blue is like a dove, not hawk. This is a blue cooperative, passive, dove-like strategy. And this red strategy is an aggressive, um, kind of antagonistic and advantage-taking hawk-like strategy. Um, notice that the, um, the hawk-like strategy can exploit the dove-like strategy, so you get a big payoff from it, whereas the um, dove um, suffers in such an encounter with a hawk. But um, hawks are not that good in other ways, because hawks... Um, do very badly against themselves because they're very aggressive. So when a hawk plays against a hawk, each of them score a payoff of negative two. Okay, so this is a well-studied kind of game, especially in evolutionary game theory. Um, John Maynard Smith and all that stuff. Um, but the idea here is not to study it as a standard kind of game, but to think of it as a game on a graph. So here's our graph. It's a circle. And we have different vertices, i.e. players, who are using different strategies. And our measure of the sort of fitness of a player is the total payoff, which it scores, when it plays a game with each of its neighbours using the allocated strategies and just adds up all the different payoffs that it gets. So, for example, here, this guy is scoring a payoff of 1 against the guy on their left, and zero against the guy on their right, as you can see from the payoff matrix here. Um, and so this is the basic idea of, this, of these best response games. The idea is that we have um, all these different vertices within a graph structure, and they have strategies, and they get, and uh, we're interested in what kinds of total payoffs they get when they engage in a game with each of their neighbors and add up their payoffs uh, according to the payoff matrix, which really defines the character of the game. So that pretty much tells you what the game theoretic character of these systems is. But in this research, we're really interested in dynamics. So we have a certain kind of way that these games evolve, and we're interested in what kinds of patterns are created in space and time. So um, the dynamics behind these systems, as I've already said, is that every player simultaneously updates to do a best response. So this guy here, for example, they get a payoff of one in this scenario. And so what they do then, they ask themselves, well, what if I'd played another strategy? Could I have done something better? Could I have got a higher total payoff? And so they think about what would have happened if they'd used the red strategy whilst their neighbours keep fixed, and they determined that yes, they would have actually got a payoff of two, which is better, if they'd instead used the red strategy. And so, um, they decide, they and so they use this, and then they say, well, I'm going to use the red strategy next time, because I should have used it last time. And this is the basic idea be behind best response games. Every player updates to use the strategy that would have maximised their total payoff given what their neighbours played last time. So, uh, this guy turns red. The thing is, though, 
every single player simultaneously go for a similar kind of reasoning. This is one of the features of, this, of these kind of systems. Every player simultaneously updates to play the best response to their surroundings. So, in a sense, what you think is the best response might not be, because you're not taking into account the fact that everyone around you is also going for a similar chain of reasoning. So, these players are somewhat myopic and somewhat limited in their rationality, uh, but that's okay. We can think of these as um, systems based on um, evolution and biology. Uh, for example, what kind of creatures are going to occupy a particular region of space is probably something which is um, influenced much more by a kind of myopic, what kind of animal suits this space best now kind of uh, attitude rather than a very kind of rational thinking it through, oh, well, if I do this and you do that and I do this and you do that. I think um, there's lots of these evolutionary processes where the strategic decisions are much more influenced by um, myopic things than, um, than this heavily rational thing. Anyway, that's all tangential. Basically... Um, we have this best response update, simultaneous best response updating. And we're interested in what kind of patterns are produced in space and time. So a pretty good way to visualize this kind of thing is by one of these so-called space-time plots. This is a very common way to visualize the dynamics of systems like this, systems like these um, games running on circle graphs, uh, which are basically just cellular automata. So the idea here is that um, our horizontal direction represents space. So these different cells here represent different uh, vertices around the circle. And of course, the colors represent which strategies these different vertices are using. And then the idea is that successive rows of this picture, reading upwards, show the successive strategy profiles of the population on different time steps. So, for example, if you just pick like a certain vertex, this is a certain player, and if you just read upwards, you can see all the different strategies that this player uses over time. So, this guy here is oscillating between using the hawk-like and the dove-like strategy. Now, of course, these systems are deterministic, and it's quite nice that you can see all the dynamics in a snapshot just by looking at one of these space-time diagrams. Um, in fact, really, these systems are cellular automata, and these are the update rules. So, um, looking at these, you can really sort of forget about the game theory, because basically, these systems just run by deterministic local rules. For example, um, if a vertex has a, a blue vertex to its left and a red vertex to its right, then it's going to turn red on the next time step. So these three kind of local rules really define the dynamics of the system. And you can see from this space-time plot here that the dynamics are pretty simple. Uh, I think the um, in this case, the, the hawks um, have sort of taken up more of the, um, of the space-time pattern, uh, but there's still these doves persistent. And, the reason really is that um, it's not good for these hawks to all be bunched together. Um, groups of hawks need to be separated by doves because um, hawks do badly against themselves. Well, OK, so what we're really interested in in this project is sort of classifying what kinds of behavior can be generated by these sort of best response games. Um, as we shall see, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, but there's definitely some very interesting geometry which lies behind these kind of systems. So, one interesting... Th I mean, once you've got the cellular automata rules, like as shown here, you can pretty much move away from game theory and just analyse the system from a kind of cellular automata perspective. And there's a lot of uh, tools developed for doing that kind of thing. Um, so then the interesting question becomes, how do you move from the game, as in from the payoff matrix and the network structure, 
to the cellular automata. And to do that, you need to do a little bit of geometry. So here, what we're doing is plotting the payoff that a, a player of the um, red strategy gets on this circle uh, as a function of the number of neighbours they have playing red. Okay, um, So we're assuming they have two neighbours here. So when this x-axis is zero, uh, this guy's getting a payoff of eight because that means that when this x-axis is zero, that means that both of this guy's neighbours are playing blue. And so this guy's getting a payoff of eight. Uh, whereas that when this fraction is one, um, both of these guys' neighbours are playing red, so they get a payoff of negative four. Okay? So we're just, we're just plotting the payoffs that you get from using red um, as a function of the number of neighbours that you have using red. And we could also make a similar plot um, for using the blue strategy. Okay? So essentially what we've got here is that um, for each possible kind of strategy distribution of your neighbours, you have a different best response. And just by looking at which of these curves um, is the higher one, at different places along this x-axis, uh, we can see which the best responses are. Uh, more particularly, this, um, this axis here, this x-axis, is really partitioned up into two pieces that I call best response regions. You see, um, when the um, fraction of neighbours that you have who are playing red is quite low, the best thing for you to do is to play red. Okay, you can see that the uh, the red curve lies above the blue curve during this region. So in this region um, of of the strategy space of your neighbours, effectively, uh, red is your best response. Um, but if you have too many neighbours playing red, then blue is your best response. So this kind of strategy space here, this x-axis, gets partitioned up into these two different best response regions. Well, so what? Well, the, re the, the reason this is important is because by observing where the endpoints and midpoints of this uh, line here, this x-axis lie, with respect to these best response regions, we can figure out what the rules behind this system are. We can figure out what kind of cellular automata is induced by this gain. Uh, in particular, for example, uh, this leftmost uh, vertex, this this um, this vertex where um, we're representing the case where all your neighbours are playing blue, this lies within the red best response region. Red is the best response here. So um, that's why um, our cellular automata is such that if you have two blue neighbours, you turn red. And this midpoint here, uh, this corresponds to the case where you've got one blue neighbour and one red neighbour. And this lies within the red best response region. That's why, if in this game, if you've got one guy next to you using red and one guy next to you using blue, you're going to turn red on the next time step. So this is the kind of thing which we're mostly interested in. We're interested in how does the game relate to the cellular automata. Um, and it turns out that understanding this kind of idea of best response regions uh, really allows you to classify all the different kinds of games which can occur when you have two different strategies. And the idea here is really pretty simple. Basically, um, every game induces a partition of this strategy space here into two different pieces, a red region and a blue region. And both of those regions are connected. And in fact, all you have to do uh, to find all the different two strategy games is just to look at all the different ways you can cut up um, this strategy space here into two different connected regions um, with respect to these three points here. These endpoints corresponding to the scenarios where both of your neighbours are using the same strategy. And this midpoint here corresponding to the scenario where you have one neighbour using the red strategy and one neighbour using the blue strategy. And so by looking at these, or equivalently by manipulating a load of inequalities, 
you can see that there are only really three fundamentally different kinds of two strategy games on the circle. In other words, there's only really three fundamentally different types of dynamics or cellular automata, if you like, which can be induced by these systems. So this first one here is what I've already discussed. Um, it corresponds to the hawk dove game, the chicken game, prisoner's dilemma, minority game. In this scenario, any payoff matrix corresponding to any one of these games generates the same dynamics, the dynamics I've already shown you. Um, or the type of dynamics I've already showed you. Uh, the other interesting um, case is where we have a, um, a strategy partition like this, where, um, where if you've got two blue neighbours, you like to play blue, and if you've got two red neighbours, you like to play red. And this corresponds to something like a majority game, or a stag hunt game. It's, it's a more kind of cooperative scenario, where you want to use the same kind of strategy as your, as your neighbours. And uh, in this case, you can see that, um, from a space-time plot here, that usually um, all the players will end up using the red strategy after a few time steps. Um, and then there's this really kind of dull scenario here where um, everyone just plays blue all the time because it strictly dominates the other strategy. So these are the really only fundamentally different kinds of dynamics you can get when you've got two strategy best response games on the circle. And um, you can see from the space-time plots here that these dynamics are not really very complicated. And in fact, um, really these dynamics are very, um, very sort of regular and um, very sort of easy to understand. And you can actually get rigorous expressions for the sort of complete dynamics of these systems. It's not really very difficult to do that. So uh, one moves on to three strategy games on the circle. And almost immediately, you start to see much more interesting kinds of dynamics. So, when I first started investigating this, I just kept generating random payoff matrices, and um, then using those as um, using those uh, and running the games and making the space-time plots on my computer. And I was quite surprised to find this game here. So. This is a, um, a payoff matrix which induces these dynamics here. And uh, it's something a bit more interesting than what we've seen before. When we start with a random initial strategy profile here, or strategy allocation if you like, uh, and then we run the thing. So our players on the circle are interacting with each other and updating via best, res via best response updating. Well, when we do that, we see this really remarkably complicated pattern uh, emerge. Um, it seems like the sort of randomness of the initial condition isn't being um, blown away like it was previously. It seems like this randomness has almost been amplified and we're getting really quite complicated dynamics. Um, so this is an example of what's known as a chaotic cellular automata. That means that if we run this thing on a big enough circle, it corresponds to a chaotic dynamical system in a formal sense. Uh, and it's also interesting to see that if we just start the thing off so that we've got one player using the green strategy while all of the players are using the blue strategy, we get this remarkably intricate pattern here, a fractal which is known as the Sapinski gasket. Um, and so it's fairly interesting that uh, these simple deterministic rules, which are generated by these games, end up making these rather complicated patterns. Uh, although I must say that it is well known that things like cellular automata can produce complexity, but I really don't think that takes away from the wonder of having such a simple system that produces such an amazingly complicated pattern. Well then, when one sees things like this, it certainly um, encourages one to try and classify all of the different dynamics. And so a good way to do this kind of thing is to take a sort of geometric view 
of these systems. And so, basically, uh, in a similar way to before, we can think about what kind of um, payoffs uh, you will get by responding to your neighbor strategies using different pure strategies. So let's just pick a given pure strategy, say the red one. Well, uh, there's all different possible strategy distributions that your neighbors might have. You know, maybe all your neighbors are playing the green strategy. Maybe they're all playing the blue. Maybe they're all playing the red. Maybe one's playing the red and one's playing the green. Uh, all the different distributions of strategies that could be used by our neighbours can be represented as points within a strategy space. And uh, in this case here, with three strategies, that strategy space can be visualised as a triangle, a strategy simplex, if you like. And for any given point, we can see which is the best response uh, to that kind of strategy profile. And basically, uh, what we what the thing corresponds to is we'll plot these three kind of planes which hover above the triangle and show what payoffs you get from using these three different pure strategies against different possible strategy distributions of your neighbors. And so how does so that's how you get this kind of picture from this kind of payoff matrix. For example, um, for example Green against green gets a payoff of 85, so the height of this point here should be 85. Um, so this is how you get a, you, you can get a geometric picture from your payoff matrix. But then how does this geometric picture relate to these rules here? Well, basically, um, once again, you have a kind of partition of this strategy space into best response regions. And the way you figure out what this partition is, is that you just look which is the highest plane, which is the highest, um, you know, which is the best response, which is the strategy which has the highest payoff above each point within the strategy space. So pick a point and then you've got these three planes hovering above, see which one is highest. And if it's the red one, then this point belongs to the red strategy region. Um, and so such a so, so such a thing leads to a best response partition of the strategy space. And um, given this, you can then find out what the rules are. And just like before, to find out what the rules are, all you have to do is look how these endpoints and midpoints lie with respect uh, to these different best response regions. For example, um, this point here between the red, sorry, between the red and the blue vert vertices of the strategy simplex, this point lies within the blue best response region. And that's why in this game, if you have one neighbor who's playing red and one neighbor who's playing blue, you're going to play the blue strategy. So this is the basic idea. Each payoff matrix defines a partition of the strategy space. And in fact, it's more than that. It defines a convex partition of a strategy space. So this kind of simplex here, um, you know, two strategies, it's a, it's a line. Three strategies, it's a triangle. Four strategies, it's a tetrahedron. Five strategies, it's a, it's a kind of four-dimensional tetrahedron, etc. The payoff matrix defines a convex partition of the, of the uh, strategy space, and the way the endpoints and midpoints of the edges in that simplex lie with respect to the best response regions defines the update rules behind the, behind the game. That really defines the cellular automata, which really is what gives you the dynamics of the system. So anyway, it turns out that there's something even more than that going on. Not only does every game define every convex partition, I mean, this is actually quite an obvious, uh, an easy thing to prove, because of basically payoff matrices involve a lot of linearity. But what's interesting is that, in fact, um, it goes the other way as well. So, in fact, given any com 
convex partition of the strategy simplex into, well, in this case, into three or less regions, you can associate those regions with colors, and then um, you can actually find a, a game which generates them. And so this is actually really, really important, because what it says is that if you want to enumerate all of these different possible games, if you want to see how many different three strategy games there are, and what they all are, all you have to do is think about all the different ways that you can cut up a triangle into three or less convex regions with respect to these endpoints and midpoints here. And so I wanted to enumerate the three strategy games on the circle, so that's just what I did. And uh, basically, all this boils down to is looking at all the different ways to cut up a triangle into three or less convex bits with respect to the endpoints and midpoints here. So this is one way to cut up the thing. And we've partitioned up this thing into three convex regions here. And uh, we can associate these regions with colors in different ways, you know. We could color this region red, or we could color it blue, or we could color it green, etc. And so each of these kind of uncolored um, partitions here corresponds to a set of games. They're the set of all games which have best response partitions which can be generated by allocating colors to these uncolored diagrams. Anyway, basically by looking at all the different ways to cut up this simplex, we can, um, we can enumerate all of these different games. And there's actually 52 fundamentally different three strategy games on a circle. And here are space time plots of each of them. So this is the one with complex dyna or chaotic dynamics that I already showed you. And there's also one other which has chaotic dynamics. Here it is. Okay, so that was successful. Now we've um, enumerated all the different best response games on the circle up to, um, up to three strategies. And so a natural question to ask then is, can we go further? Can we enumerate all of the different systems? Well, this theorem here turns out to be crucial uh, in that regard. Um, Because this, um, I've already really discussed it, but it, it gives you a, a link between the, um, the way the payoff matrix induces the cellular automata and the geometry of the best response region partitions. So what it says is that a cellular automata corresponds to a best response game, uh, if and only if there is a partition of the simplex into convex regions which generates it. So it, Basically, one thing this theorem implies is that if you want to enumerate all of the different um, all of the different games on a circle with a given number of strategies, you just have to look at all the different ways to partition up the simplex into um, a number of pieces equal to that number of strategies, a number of convex pieces. So this gives you this sort of interrelationship between the um, between the convex partitions and the games. So let me just show you an example of this. Suppose you have a cellular automata with these kind of rules, and then you're interested in, is there a game which generates this cellular automata? Uh, the answer is no, because if you think about what kind of partition of a strategy space would generate such a game, it would have to be something like this and it would have to involve a region which is not convex. This red region here is not even connected, never mind convex. Um, but it turns out that this theorem here can really be used to enumerate lots of different systems. Uh, because basically, if you have a K-strategy game, if you have K-strategies and you have a given uh, circle, if you want to find out all the games on that circle, you just have to look at all the different ways to partition up the simplex into k or less convex regions with respect to the endpoints and midpoints of that circle, of that simplex, sorry.
And so these kind of ideas can be used. Uh, the, essentially, this theorem can be used to enumerate uh, all of the different um, games, two and three strategy games on the circle, as I've already shown you, by looking at the different ways to cut up the line and looking at the different ways to cut up the triangle. If you're interested in enumerating the four strategy games on a circle, taking a geometric approach becomes a little bit more difficult because it's quite hard to think about all the thousands of different ways to partition up a tetrahedron with respect to its endpoints and midpoints. And then when you're on to a five strategy case, you've got a sort of four dimensional shape and it becomes quite difficult to think about how to do it properly. Uh, and so I was able to, um, I was able to change this sort of geometric um, relationship into something a bit more combinatorial. And it turns out that one can isolate particular kinds of um, parts of rules which shouldn't occur if you want that rule to be generatable by a best response game. Um, and so, in fact, it has some really interesting relationships to graph theory. So it has to do with uh, the theory of alternating cycles in network structures. Uh, you can see the paper for their full details because I don't want to get into uh, great technicalities now. Um, but essentially, um, one can enumerate all of the different uh, best response games that are played on a circle with four strategies. And there are many thousand of those, some of which have highly complex dynamics. Um, you can also use this kind of approach to study more general kinds of uh, games on more general kinds of network structures. Um, for example, here we have what I call a circle with self-linkage. Um, and in this case, every, every vertex has three neighbours. They are linked to the vertex on their left, the vertex on their right, and they're also linked to themselves. And so now, since our vertices have more connections, uh, we can apply a similar kind of procedure to enumerate the different games in this case, but um, our strategy space is more complicated. We have more strategies, so we have more points uh, in the strategy space, and we're interested in where these points lie with respect to these different best response regions. For example, uh, if you have one neighbour using green, another neighbour using green, and another neighbour using green, then um, to find out what your best response is, you want to look at where this central point in the strategy simplex lies with respect to the different best response regions. In this case, it lies in the uh, green best response region. And so there you go. Um, and so when you consider, and so you can also use this same kind of method or a similar kind of method to enumerate the best response games on much more complicated looking network structures. Basically, it's just this idea of looking how the, um, how the strategy space can be partitioned up with respect to these discrete points in this kind of um, regular structure um, within the strategy simplex. Anyway, um, some of these systems with self-linkage are pretty interesting, like this one shown here. When we initiate this system with all the players using random strategies, we find that the system seems to be quite complicated for a long time. But then almost seamlessly, these players are actually synchronizing themselves. And then suddenly we hit a point at time step 40 where all the players suddenly start using the blue strategy and then the system becomes fixed. So it's interesting to see things like this and it makes one wonder whether these could be useful for things like amorphous computation or decentralized computation because you know you can achieve things like some kind of global clock or synchronization um, in these quite unexpected ways.